Welcome to our Participatory Medicine Learning Exchange. I'm Sarah Crude, the Acting Executive Director of the Society for Participatory Medicine. I'm also the CEO of the Cancer 101 Foundation and founder of the Health Collaboratory. Thank you for joining us today to talk about social isolation and loneliness. Meaningful human connection is one of the greatest currencies in life, yet we often underestimate how important it is. You don't have to be alone to be lonely. Loneliness isn't about the number of people you know or how often you see them or even a bad day when you don't feel as connected with others. Loneliness affects the lives of millions of people and can be a passing emotion or a recurring sense of desperation. For all of us, it's part of being human. So what do we do about it? It's an honor to partner with our speakers today to shed light on this very important topic, one that's often overlooked, and I will introduce them shortly. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to discuss the history behind the learning exchange. So participatory medicine is a movement in which network patients shift from being mere passengers to responsible drivers of their health, and in which providers encourage and value them as full partners. SPM's mission is to catalyze collaborative partnerships across the continuum of care to optimize health and healthcare. The Society's foundation is based upon four pillars, which include community building, advocacy and policy, research and education, um, which ironically spell care, which we didn't do on purpose. Uh, to learn more, I encourage you to visit our website, participatorymedicine.org. Now, the beauty of those goals is that many of you are already out there working on these pillars and advancing participatory medicine, and the learning exchange was created to help you showcase your work. Understanding the work we're conducting in our individual silos can help us learn from one another, allow us to build upon ideas, forge collaborations, provide a forum for feedback, and hopefully avoid duplication of efforts. The learning exchange allows us to also capture how we're collectively moving the participatory medicine uh, needle, whether it's through our day-to-day -day personal experiences with healthcare or our work in this area. So many thanks to our sponsors, Accenture and Vocera. Vocera, who is also hosting our technicals through WebEx, offers the leading platform for clinical communication and workflow and their mission is to simplify and improve the lives of healthcare, prof uh, healthcare professionals and patients while enabling hospitals to enhance quality of care and operational efficiency. And Accenture is a Fortune Global 500 company. Uh, it's a global management consulting and professional services firm that provides strategy consulting, digital technology and operation services in over 120 countries. So I'd like to introduce our speakers and give you an overview of the next hour. Today we have a packed agenda where we'll uh, plan to learn from the personal experiences of two patients, delve into the data and research, and then segue into potential solutions to tackle these issues. We'll start out with a patient perspective from Reed Lopez, who is also a health educator and patient advocate, and she will shed light on her experience with loneliness and social isolation. Dr. Julianne holt lundstadt Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Brigham Young University, will do a deeper dive into the issues and health risks associated with this epidemic. Dr. Jeremy Noble, who is founder and president of the Unlonely Project and faculty at the Center for Primary Care, Harvard Medical School, will discuss potential solutions and steps we can take to address this growing problem. And then we'll end with a dialogue with uh, someone also affected by loneliness and social isolation, Gabe Howard, who is also a mental health advocate and podcast host. And then we'll open it up to you, our audience, for questions. But feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation uh, through the chat feature. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Ree Lopez, who will share her personal experience as both a patient and advocate. Uh, Ree holds a graduate degree in public health with a specialty in health education and promotion. She is particularly interested in the intersection of chronic illness and mental health, which draws upon her educational background and lived experience. After a health crisis and subsequent diagnosis of chronic and hemiplegic migraine, her experiences with isolation and depression led her to start advocacy work in the chronic illness community. Ree? Oh. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, 
today I would like to start by telling you a story. It is a story about a woman who was in the prime of her life when the sudden onset of a mysterious illness threatened to take everything from her. As you may have guessed already, that woman is me. On March 29th of 2016, I started with a headache in the morning. By dinner time, I felt something that can only be described as a constant explosion in my skull. I lost the ability to speak and all function on my right side. Despite a rapid arrival to the emergency department, I was actually discharged later without any idea of what had happened to me. I would spend the next several months with near daily migraines and greatly diminished strength on my right side. I couldn't be left alone. Besides family caregivers, I had a flurry of friends and home health workers coming in daily. I was never lonely, but all of that changed after three months. I thought that as a health professional, my awareness of the dangers of social isolation would protect me from its negative effects on my mental and overall health. It didn't. From my background in research, I had read much of the available research revealing poor health outcomes overall in patients with loneliness or isolation. Most of the research discusses loneliness in the elderly, but I wasn't even out of my 30s. I felt that surely I would make a swift recovery from whatever was stealing my life from me. The thing about loneliness is that it creeps up on you slowly and you think you are okay until you aren't. A year went by and then two and I was not better. Diagnoses piled up. In just two years, I was unrecognizable even to myself. There are numerous barriers to social interaction when chronically ill. Isolation is not just physical, but emotional. One of the largest barriers was the loss of my mobility. Just getting to places became near impossible because I couldn't manage stairs and I couldn't drive. My parents lived directly across the street from me and it was agonizing just to go to their house because they had three stairs. Dietary restrictions from numerous diagnosed food allergies effectively made it so I couldn't go out to eat anywhere. And I couldn't have anybody bring any take, takeout in to me. And since so much socialization occurs around food, it just increased my loneliness and feeling of being an outsider. In the darkness of my own mind, I became overcome with grief and a deep embarrassment I couldn't manage my own home or take care of my own children. Who would even want to visit and see me living like this? Emotional barriers perhaps take the greatest toll. I lost my life as I knew it before and was thrust into this new world that I didn't understand and it wasn't even created for me. The process of grieving seemed endless and lonely. I felt like no one understood or cared to understand that I felt robbed of the life that I was promised. I could no longer discuss my job, as I had none, or outings with family, because I was confined to my house. Even discussions with my closest family members were difficult, and I started to avoid my grandparents, my aunts and uncles, and even friends that I had made feel like family. I was just ashamed because I wasn't recovering and maybe I didn't try hard enough and I was tired of answering questions about when I would get better. I didn't feel that there would ever be a better. The isolation affected me in many ways. Mentally, I became anxious and deeply depressed. I felt as if I lacked any purpose. I just had so much time to just think of me and my aloneness and everything that was going wrong. Physically, I noticed that I became weaker. 
There was no one to get up for, and I certainly wasn't going back to the gym. I forgot medications and exercises prescribed and ruminated in the quiet of my life as every day strung into another. Multiple cancellations at the last moment due to my health led to no invitations. Friendships grew distant and strained, and some crumbled to nothing. And I watched my family have fun without me. Eventually, I hit a point where I knew that I could not go on like this. I actually fired nearly all of my health care providers and started from scratch. I talked about my loneliness on the very first visit to my new primary care, and we decided together on a course of medication and therapy. I started to think creatively of how I could work around my health condition and make connections with others, and this led me online. I found that I was pulled towards people in similar circumstances, and I developed some amazing friendships, which I discuss in my most recent blog. My small group of support became my soul sisters, and they were my core. It was then I finally started to really process the grief that I was holding in, and I felt less alone. And I flung myself headfirst into advocacy work, and that gave me so much purpose. As a patient, I have certainly had a lot of time to think on solutions to social isolation. For providers, there is so much potential to have an enormous effect on patients by including these very topics in mental health screeners. And it needs to be something that we're doing at every point of contact. I saw my doctor for two years and they never asked how I was doing. Make sure that you have educational materials and resources for social services. And most importantly, ask your patients how they are and then really listen to what we're saying. Just a moment can make all the difference. Caregivers and care partners can also play a role. Even with mobility challenges, there are outlets for finding a new sense of purpose. And make sure that you're getting out too because you can become isolated as well. And that serves neither your interests or those of your loved one. Remind us that people do care about us and invite others for short visits around our schedule because sometimes we're going to forget, if not all of the time. And don't forget to listen to us too. You may be the first to notice when we are struggling. My experiences have only brushed the surface, but I would like to end with a quote from Helen Keller. Walking with a friend in the dark is better than walking alone in the light. Though unconventional in my approach, online friendships have made a world of difference to me. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your profound story, Ree. That was amazing. Um, and the tips as well uh, will really be helpful to our attendees. And I'll have uh, a few questions for you at the end, and I see a couple of questions also coming through. Thank you so much. Thank you. So next I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Julianne holt lundstad And she Thank was you. at the foundation with a um, deeper dive spotlight on the issue of uh, loneliness and Social Isolation. Dr. Holt Lundstedt is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Brigham Young University, where she's also the director of the so Social Neuroscience Lab. Her research is focused on the long-term health effects of social connection, and her work has been seminal in the recognition of social isolation and loneliness as risk factors for early mortality. Uh, she's worked with government organizations aimed at addressing this issue and serves as a scientific advisor for the Foundation for Art and Healing, Research Advisory Panel for AARP, as well as United Healthcare. Dr. holt -Lundstedt? Thank you. Thank you for including me in this webinar, and um, thank you, Ree, for sharing your, your uh, personal experiences. 
I'm going to be really highlighting some of the science and the evidence behind this problem. Um, I'm trying to advance my slides. Oh, there we go. Uh, so I'm going to start off by uh, really focusing on defining uh, what exactly the problem is and then sharing some of the evidence uh, that tells us the extent to which this is an issue and how uh, serious this problem is. I'll also highlight some of the risk factors and then uh, conclude by uh, talking about some of the uh, evidence around potential solutions and challenges that are faced in, in addressing this issue. So I wanted to first start by uh, acknowledging that loneliness and so social isolation are not the same thing. Uh, these are terms that are often used interchangeably, uh, but, and, and that may be because oftentimes they can go hand in hand, uh, but they are distinct uh, experiences. So for instance, social isolation is thought to be objectively being alone having few relationships or infrequent social contact, whereas loneliness is the subjective feeling of, of alone um, or feeling alone um, and has also been defined as the discrepancy between one's desired level of social connection and one's actual level. And so while uh, many times people who are socially isolated may feel lonely, um, you can be isolated and not feel lonely, and you can be lonely and not necessarily isolated. Uh, and so I think it's important to then identify, well, what exactly is the, the problem that we're dealing with? Uh, is it the perception of loneliness? Is it lacking social contact, interaction, or, or perceived support? Um, perhaps it's lacking a, a close intimate partner or someone in the home to rely on in times of need, um, or maybe being in a strained relationship or lacking supportive, rela uh, supportive relationships. Um, and I hope you can see from even this incomplete list uh, that uh, in essence there is a lack of precision around what exactly uh, may be problematic, and that it may be much more complex uh, than, than we suspect. And in the research, if we look at how uh, um, this has been uh, examined, we can see across studies that this has, in essence, been examined in uh, three broad ways. Uh, and so, the way in which it has been measured has uh, um, included either structural, functional, or quality aspects of social relationships. And so structural would include the existence and interconnections among different social ties or roles. Uh, functional would include the actual or perceived uh, resources that are available uh, by our relationships. And then, of course, there are the positive and negative qualities of relationships. It's important to recognize that each of these measure, measurement approaches have been significantly associated with health outcomes and that the, each may influence health in different ways. So uh, my colleagues and I have argued that uh, we need to use the term social connection as an umbrella term to encompass the way in which we connect to others via the existence of relationships in the, our roles, a sense of connection that results from actual or perceived support or inclusion, and a sense of connection to others that is based on positive and negative qualities. And that, con that this connection is on a risk continuum from low to high, uh, so such that uh, in other words, uh, high, high social connection is associated with protection and low social connection is associated with risk. 
And so examples of low social connection would include living alone, social isolation, loneliness, and poor quality relationships. So in other words, the problem is low social connection or social disconnection. We also have good evidence that a significant portion of the population is affected by um, or lacks social connection. So uh, we can look to prevalence data. So for instance, U.S. Census data uh, indicates that more than a quarter of the U.S. population lives alone. Over half of the U.S. adult population is unmarried. One in five have never married. And the divorce rate in the U.S. is around 40% for first marriages and higher for second marriages. We also have data from nationally representative samples that suggest that this is a, has a significant um, uh, prevalence in, uh, among adults as well. So if we look at a recent uh, survey by Cigna that came out recently, we can see that almost half of Americans report some, sometimes are always feeling alone or left out. And one in four do not feel that there are people who really understand them. Two in five feel their relationships are not meaningful. And uh, as uh, illustrated by our, our previous speaker, not everyone who is lonely is an older adult. And in fact, this can uh, influence people across ages. And according to this recent Cigna data, Generation Z or younger adults um, are reporting some of the greatest levels of loneliness. <clears throat> so we have good evidence that uh, this is uh, affecting a significant portion of the population and that um, we need not uh, restrict our, our efforts um, to any one particular uh, group. We also have evidence that there's economic costs associated with, with this. So for instance, a recent AARP report found that uh, older adults um, who are socially isolated, that this was associated with $6.7 billion in additional Medicare spending each year. We also can look to epidemiological data to establish uh, the magnitude of the problem. And this data looks at the extent to which uh, places individuals at risk for premature mortality. And if we average across the measurement approaches that I described earlier, we find that social connection is associated with a 50% reduction in risk for early mortality. And importantly, this is adjusting for age and initial health status that rules out uh, reverse causality. Uh, we also have data um, from meta-analytic data that looks at and compares objective versus subjective isolation. And what this has shown is that there's an increased likelihood of death um, associated with loneliness, social isolation, and living alone. Each one of these significantly predicts risk for premature mortality and equivalently so. So both objective and subjective isolation are risk factors. And this is a consistent across gender, initial health status, cause of death, and country of origin. We also have good evidence uh, that this is comparable to other risk factors that we take very seriously for our health. So for instance, indicators of social connection are illustrated in the orange bars, whereas uh, leading health indicators are uh, indicated in the blue bars. Uh, and so uh, the very top blue bar is smoking up to 15 cigarettes per day. We also have uh, comparisons to alcohol consumption, flu vaccine, physical inactivity, obesity, and air pollution. And as we can see, that while uh, there is some variability in terms of the predictive uh, strength of various indicators of social connection, that these are comparable with these other factors that we take very seriously that receive considerable attention and resources 
in terms of public health. We also have good evidence that uh, there's effect on health and well-being. For instance, uh, this is associated with increased risk for heart disease and stroke, increased risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, wounds heal slower, greater perceived stress and depression, and poorer sleep. We also have evidence of potential uh, risk factors. And um, importantly, social disconnection rarely is caused by a single event, and more often it is the result of multiple causes. These include poor health and well-being, life transition, role loss or change, societal barriers, lack of access and inequality, and communication barriers. And because there is no single cause of social disconnection, no one approach will work for everyone in terms of addressing it. Which raises the big question is what can we do about it and what works and what doesn't? And this is one of the big challenges that we face right now because the scientific liter literature on the effectiveness of interventions is mixed, meaning that some are effective and some are not. So we need to be careful to recognize that not all efforts may be uh, successful. It's important to recognize that because of uh, multiple causes, that if our efforts are not aimed and not responsive to the individual's needs, uh, that this, this could potentially actually be damaging. Uh, so for instance, um, uh, received support is one of the poorest predictors of, of outcomes, possibly because of this mismatch. And just because someone receives support doesn't necessarily mean it's helpful. Um, and in fact, uh, when it is not responsive, this is associated with poorer outcomes, including exacerbated physiological stress responses. So we need to also recognize that most of the efforts thus far have been focused on on individual-based uh, efforts, meaning that they are intensive efforts focused specifically on individuals um, who are at great risk. Um, but there are additional opportunities to intervene if we look and borrow from public health and utilize the social ecological model and recognize that there are opportunities to intervene at an interpersonal, organizational, um, community and societal level. Regardless of uh, the, the levels of approach, uh, general approaches to reduce risk can um, and should include not only uh, supporting and maintaining existing relationships, building new relationships, as well as psychological approaches to changing our thinking about relationships. And this could happen at societal level efforts, including the kinds of things that we do and build our environment to make uh, relationships and interacting more feasible, to the kinds of efforts that uh, occur in a health clinic, to our own interpersonal relationships and how we may um, foster our relationships, work on building new relationships, as well as addressing um, our, our thinking and approaches uh, on this. Uh, and so regardless from an individual or practitioner, practitioner perspective, uh, we have good evidence that we should be taking this seriously for our health. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holt-Munstead. Uh, this data truly sheds light on how big of a problem this is and why we can no longer ignore it. So next I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeremy Noble. Uh, as a practicing general internist for many years, Dr. Noble experienced the front lines of healthcare and its delivery, uh, currently through his faculty appointments at the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School, Dr. Noble's teaching research and community-based projects address the design of healthcare delivery systems that improve quality, cost effectiveness, and access. Uh, he's the founder and president of the Foundation for Art and Healing, which he'll talk about, 
and his work is dedicated to exploring the important relationship between creative expression and health and well-being, bringing those benefits to individuals and communities through innovative programs and an active uh, research agenda. Uh, Dr. Noble will be playing a video, so please turn on your computer sound as well. Dr. Noble? Thanks, Sarah, and um, thanks to the Society uh, for Participatory Medicine for sponsoring this webinar and also to, the, the, uh, to Accenture, Vocera, and also the fellow panelists and also everyone who took a little time out of their day to tune in. I'm going to spend 10 or 12 minutes talking not so much about the problem of loneliness, but what we do about it. First bit of an introduction, as Sarah mentioned, I am a medical um, practitioner, but really um, I'm here today representing some of the work we're doing at the Foundation for Art and Healing and the Unlonely Project uh, in particular, which, you know, kind of really does focus on the basic issue of distress caused by loneliness and isolation and looks in kind of interesting ways that we can begin to address it. So the three ideas I'll cover in, in my time today, um, or the, the webinar will cover and I'll touch on, is the loneliness and social disconnection is this century's invisible epidemic. I think you've heard both the personal uh, view of that from Rhee and then the professional summary of that uh, from Dr. Holt Lundstedt. And that obviously if that's the challenge, um, fostering social connection is an important and timely opportunity. And then I'm going to spend time maybe um, drawing out some interesting ideas people might find intriguing or resonate to in their own personal experience is that creative arts expression is an enabler for the kind of connection that we believe and have seen and have studied can be an important pushback against social isolation uh, and loneliness. So begin by asking maybe a provocative question, why has there never been a culture without art? And maybe it is because it allows us to connect and that that connection is in some interesting way associated with our survival. And just, you know, but is there a science base for this? Can the arts heal? What is the state of that current science? And there is quite a bit of an evidentiary base. For those who'd like to come to our site um, and look at it, uh, we collect some of that, make it easily available. So uh, unlonelyproject.org has some of that. But I'll quickly summarize it here. And, and the, the research seems to indicate that creative arts expression of various types, and we'll talk more about what kind of creative arts uh, seem to be effective, does reduce disease burden and symptoms, has been shown to assist in recovery from trauma, allows people, perhaps no surprise because of what the arts do, to develop a capacity for self-reflection that then, with guidance or focus, can lead to altered behaviors, altered thinking patterns, and ultimately foster a sense of connection with oneself and others. And so how do the arts do that? And so in our work, we've actually teased that uh, question apart a little bit and identified three very important creative arts activities or activities related to creative expression that I'm sure everyone on this webinar will recognize. So the first is the creation of the artwork itself. And in that moment, you are allowing yourself to explore thoughts and feelings, you're not thinking about emails that have to be returned. You're not thinking about other distractions. And, and that allows you to experience that moment in ways that are rarer and rarer in modern life and also give you some sense of how you might relate to yourself and others. So that's the creation aspect. But then you can move past that in the sharing of your work. And in that, that specific act of sharing through your creative expression, your own thoughts, your own feelings, is fundamental to fostering a kind of connection. The third activity is the receiving work we all do when we are engaging with the work of others. And so in an interesting way, when someone is willing to take the energy, effort, and courage to make a piece of creative work and share it with an individual or an audience, and that audience or individual receives it actively, it's like an electric circuit is being completed and there's a kind of connection there that we think is both enduring and health enhancing. Now, interestingly, interestingly when you say what kind of art, and, and a lot of our, our studies and research look at the traditional four, music of various sorts, visual arts of various sorts, language arts, that's where um, creative writing comes in, but also theater, 
and dance and movement. Those are the traditional four. But we encourage people not to ignore what we often call the big three, which is the creative expression many people do daily, culinary arts or cooking, textile arts, which includes sewing, knitting, and so forth, and gardening, which is a very creative expression that a, a friend and colleague of ours calls the world's slowest performance art. So if you're out there as a gardener, you're an artist too. So we've been at this for about uh, 10 or 12 years doing um, various kinds of call it clinical trials, but also a lot of um, kind of partnering supportive work and uh, we published some of that. Again, it's on our, it's all on our site at unlonelyproject.org, working in various areas. This, this happens to be a slide shot of some work we did uh, using creative arts expression with African-American middle-aged women with uncontrolled diabetes. And we were able very clearly to show using uh, the UCLA loneliness scale and various uh, health outcomes parameter scales and patient activation scales that in fact the creative arts expression made people feel more connected and better. So that, that, all that work kind of led us to the formation of the Unlonely Project, launched two years ago. I'll spend the rest of the time really kind of diagramming out what the Unlonely Project is. But as the cover slide here says, it's a multifaceted initiative that seeks to reduce the burden of loneliness and, and its stigma. And also, as I say, to do that in three ways. First, create awareness. So this webinar itself, I think, is part of that effort. The second is to reduce stigma around loneliness and isolation. I think, as you heard already in Marie's description of her um, experience of being alone and lonely and isolated with her medical condition, there was a kind of guilt or shame associated with the illness and then with feeling lonely about the illness that often prevents people for, from asking for help or seeking the help that will produce the kind of connection that they, they really need. And then the third uh, goal is to activate some programming, and I'll share with you what some of that programming looks like. So if you like to see it diagrammatically, this is what it looks like in schema. So quick review, goal one, increase awareness. Goal two, reduce stigma. Goal three, activate programming. So before you can have programming out there, you have to have awareness, otherwise no one's going to plug in and engage. So. Uh, a year ago, we launched our first ever online film festival, as far as we could tell, the first one out there, that focuses on loneliness and isolation in various populations, actually as the subject matter of all the short films. And we'll share with you a trailer shortly of the second annual film festival that launched um, just a few, a few weeks ago. But what's important to recognize in what we've developed here and you know, we won't do a full kind of review of it on this webinar, but we encourage you to come to unlonelyfilms.org, see it for yourself, is you get the experience of seeing something related to loneliness in the powerful way that a short, well-done film can describe, whether it's the loneliness of an older adult, someone with a major illness, a minority or marginalized uh, person, how they struggle really to achieve a sense of connection. But on our platform, when you're done watching that film, you can now ask questions, self-guided tours, if you will, of your reaction to the film, creative act activities you could do, and then ways that you can actually um, seek additional resources and seek additional ways to be connected. So I'll take a minute. I'll again invite people who have turned down their sound to turn it up, and we're gonna just take you on a quick tour of the power of short film to talk about loneliness and social isolation.
Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that quick review. Let's take you back to the slides now. So you see a short film, and I'll give you through a, a quick walkthrough of what the back end experience looks like. So you see a short film on loneliness, whether it's college loneliness or uh, PTSD from military treatment. You're welcome to the site where you, you actually get to watch that, that trailer, which then leads you to a page where you can select a film category. So, you know, very easy, very easy to navigate. You can kind of maybe read some of these uh, selections here, these little tabs, uh, one of which is highlighted. And when you click on the tab, you come to a subset of the films, you pick one. This is called A Kitchen Can Take You Back. And step one is watch the film. So it all begins really with the power of short film to engage the viewer, to get past bias or stigma you might have, and really expose yourself through, again, through the power of creative expression to loneliness and social, social isolation removed from you, right? So you get to experience it as it's, as it's made real by someone else. You then have a chance, after you've seen the film, to do step two, which is to explore things after watching the films. I'll explode that. Um, and so what do these things look like? I won't read through these. But questions, reflexive um, uh, questions where you can ask yourself about your experience of the films, and then arts activities. Step three is you visit posts, make comments. Steps four and five to share and explore further. So again, not trying to do the whole exposure here of what we've been up to, but I think you get a sense that it begins with the film as a catalyst, but then it invites you not only to deepen your own experience with loneliness with some very specific questions and activities, but then share that with others and build community. So as you see, we're following this arc of creative experience to address loneliness programmatically. Use the arts not as a solution directly, but as a catalyst to facilitate attraction, engagement, activation, support, and ultimately connection. So that's our call to action, which is, and this is really great being on this webinar, first, increase awareness. Let's talk about it. Who's lonely? Why are we lonely? How can we be less lonely? What have we experienced? And in doing that, I think we normalize the experience more in line, ironically, with the data that Dr. Holt Lundstedt shared from the recent stigma study that showed that as many as 50% of people are significantly lonely right now, up from numbers we used to think where it was a third. So um, how can we all be lonely when we're all in a sense struggling together? So stigma holds us back. We have to get past that. We think conversations are a powerful way to do that. And of course, activating programming. So thank you very much for your attention. We'll turn it back over to a patient perspective and then have plenty of time left for questions. Thank you, Dr. Noble, for walking us through some of these catalyst solutions uh, and the overview of the Unlonely Project. I actually had the honor of attending the conference this year, and it was fantastic. So thank you again. Uh, so next we'll have a conversation with Gabe Howard. Uh, Gabe is someone who I've only spoken to a few times uh, via telephone, but I feel as if I've known him for ages. Uh, Gabe Howard was formally diagnosed with bipolar and anxiety disorders after being committed to a psychiatric hospital in 2003. And now in recovery, Gabe is a prominent mental health activist and host of the award-winning Psych Central Show podcast and a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast. He is also an award-winning writer and speaker traveling nationally to share the humorous yet educational story of his bipolar life. So Gabe, um, tell us who you are and what you want to be when you grow up. Well, first off, I don't want to grow up. I mean, Growing old is required, growing up is optional, and, and I really try to live my life that way. Absolutely true. So it's, um, there's something that you said in a recent conversation, um, you can be in a crowded room and still feel alone. Uh, so you have an extensive social media following where you're quite active and popular. You're, in my opinion, quite engaging. You have a large listener base on your podcast. You're happily married. And you may not fit the traditional mold of how society has defined loneliness. So can you shed light on, on your personal experience and when you realize it may be an issue? Yeah, it, it's really fascinating that, that people assume that you can't be alone if you're surrounded by other people, which is really sort of weird because we understand that children can be lonely in school and yet, you know, schools are just 
have to fill with with people and kids and even people the same age. So loneliness is really more of an inability to connect or feeling disconnected. It's not about having a whole bunch of people around you. Uh, you, you know, finding people is easy. You can just go to a mall. But that doesn't mean that you're connected, engaged. doesn't mean that you feel supportive or that you belong. Uh, it just means that you're in the vicinity of another carbon-based life form. That's, that's not what we're looking for. We're, we're looking for connection. Right. And what did you do when you first realized that this was an issue? And what would you recommend to others based upon that experience? I, I first realized that, again, I'm a very social guy. I, I love to talk to people. Whenever I take those tests that, like, measure whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, I'm so far on the extroverted side that people almost think that it's a mistake. I'm like, you know, something's weird. We've never had 100% extrovert before. I just really, 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 really love people. So when I'm not connecting with people, it, it really, it saps my energy, which, you know, we, we all know that, or, you know, most people understand that, you know, an extrovert gets energy from people, an introvert is drained by people. That's, that's a real, not a doctor, real, real basic explanation. So when I'm not connecting with people, it just really makes me feel very lonely, isolated, sad. And if somebody with, you know, mental illness, uh, feeling alone, isolated, and sad can quickly lead to depression, which can quickly lead suicidal thoughts, et cetera. So the thing that I tried to do was have meaningful conversations. And the, the way that I did this was really to ask people questions about themselves. I think that sometimes people try to connect with others by telling people about themselves. And that, that is one part of it. I mean, I certainly want to share my life with people. But I was able to connect with people a lot faster when I asked them what was important to them. Um, also, I think that Adults, we really look for differences in people. You know, we 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 try to find, you know, it, it's, it's somebody different from us, and we don't we don't like those differences. Instead of searching out the similarities, so I have this this really broad social circle filled with people from different political leanings, religious leanings, just you know, people that are just should not be natural allies. But the reason that we are is because we found the similarities. We all like the same television show or the same sport, and we just agree not to talk politics or religion or, you know, whatever thing can divide us. So I really recommend that. Forget about the differences. Focus on the similarities. And loneliness, the feeling can be hard to put into words. It's been described by some as a chronic ache, while others describe it as a feeling of a wound. How does loneliness actually feel to you? It's painful. It's you're, you're right. It is hard to put it in words because I want to say soul sucking. But what does soul sucking feel like? Uh, it's it's not a good feeling. It feels lethargic. It feels tired. It feels sad. It, it I, I really think that on, on some level deep inside, everybody wants to be around people. I, I think it really just is something about us uh, as, as, as humans. Now, the, the number of people may vary or the length of time may vary, but I, I really think you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody that could just spend their entire life completely alone. And when you're just not honoring that, when you, when you want to share or talk or tell or just get a difference of opinion or just even be annoyed by somebody, I mean, that's, that's an experience as well and you can't have it, you, you feel incomplete. You just feel incomplete. And again, I, you're right, that's tough. I don't, I don't know what incomplete feels like, but I venture to guess that a lot of people can kind of understand it. Absolutely. And you can be married or have a partner but still feel lonely. And based on your experience, what are steps that have worked to help build that sense of connection um, the, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Well, one of the hardest things for me is that I, I'm a person living with bipolar disorder. And, you know, that, that's a unique experience, you know, living with mental illness. And my wife, no mental illness. I, I always joke that the only thing that's wrong with her is that she chose to marry me. And that's like one little thing. So sometimes it's very, very lonely because I'm, I'm trying to explain to her what it's like to be anxious. And I mean, like, like you know, not, not, not anxious, but like clinical anxiety or what it's like to be depressed, not sad, depressed. And 
I, I can tell she's trying, but she just doesn't get it. You know, she, she really still believes that depression is just like extra sad. Um, she, she just can't understand because she's never felt it. And we talk a lot and, you know, that really helps. And, you know, there, she always used the, she, 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 oh, excuse me. She uses the example that no matter how men try, no matter how hard men try, they won't know what it's like to be pregnant. We, we can we can ask questions, we can understand, but we cannot experience pregnancy. So it, it's kind of like that, it, except it's just always kind of a disconnect. So the thing that I do is I, I talk to my other mentally ill friends about that experience and commiserate with them, and I find the thing that my wife and I have in common, and we commiserate over those things. The longer we've been married, the easier it is. We're going on six years. We've shared a lot together. But in the beginning, it was it was really tough. Uh, she's also excuse me. She's also learned to just give me space. You know, sometimes I I just have to be depressed by myself and lean on others. And I know that's very very hard for her, but you know, it, it's better to give somebody space than to not give somebody space and make it worse. And you know, these, these are very hard things because I know that when something's wrong with her, I, I don't want to like sit back and wait until she works through it. I I want to fix it immediately. It, it's 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 hard, but that's what we've worked out. Absolutely, and you know it's interesting. Research has shown that those with um, less than three confidants are more than twice as likely to die from heart disease. And you and I talked a little bit about confidants and the correlation with marriage and certain expectations, where um, one person may have to play too many roles. Anything that you can talk to us about um, that piece of the puzzle? Yeah, I think that you can really exhaust somebody if they have to be your everything. I, I don't know if it's because I'm cynical, if it's because I, I, I turned 40, but whenever somebody says, I'm searching for my soulmate or I want to marry my best friend, I just like roll my eyes immediately because I think, wow, you are putting just an incredible burden on a single person. Uh, I, I don't want one person in my life that fills all my needs because by definition, they're going to have to sleep at some point or you know, go away at some point and then I won't have anybody else. I like having lots of different people that play lots of different roles. Um, if for no other reason than, hey, they can take breaks from me. But I, I like that. I like having multiple people. So in, in marriage, I, I really think we have this sort of romanticized idea that one person is going to be our everything. And uh, yeah, I, I really think people are just setting themselves up to fail at that point. Uh, that, that's my opinion. Please, please, all the 20-year-olds, don't write me angry letters and tell me how <laughs> I'm wrong. I've been divorced, like, so many times. But uh, I already know that I'm wrong. But sincerely, I, I, I think that we need to find people who have these similarities with us and, you know, collect them. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that really helps. So... I'm going to sh uh, shift tracks to technology. Uh, technology is somewhat of a double-edged sword in that we can use social media to stay in touch with friends and family. Um, there are many who might connect online who wouldn't otherwise, like online mental health therapy or online communities where being anonymous can help someone to open up and seek support. However, there's debate that technology can also lead to disconnect. Um, at the end of the day, technology is just the tool, and it's how we use that tool that matters. So what role has social media or technology played in your feeling of isolation? This is what's fantastic. You're absolutely right. You, you just described it, social media completely. It can connect you to people all over the world. It can give you a sense of safety and that anonymity. It can allow you to find people who agree with you and, and they can be 20 states over. My family doesn't live in Columbus, but or in where I live, they don't live in the same state as me, but we talk every day because we have Facebook and because we have phones to share pictures. And I'm watching my niece grow up because of videos uh, that, we, that my sister sends me via the phone. But by the same token, it, it's got this real dark side that you can say these incredibly cold and nasty things to people and not have to look them in the eye after you do it. People have this sense of bravery where they'll just say things that they would never tell somebody in person, but they feel empowered because it's the internet. And because again, they're, they're not occupying that space. So they don't have to see the devastation that they've caused. And really that's just life. I, I, I think that lots of things have a plus and a minus. 
that that's really just the reality of it. I mean, you can eat cake every day, and that's really good. That's a plus but you're gonna end up really sick and fat and unhealthy and well, that's a negative. So you've gotta moderate that. I'm happy that the internet exists because it allowed me to grow my advocacy in a way that I would not have been able to do otherwise. Uh, we're doing this webinar right now because of technology and I'm hopeful that the people listening are like, I never thought of that and this will make my life better because of it. But as sure as I'm saying that there's somebody out there right now on social media just tearing somebody apart because they understand one fraction of their life based on a picture. And that's sad. And I hope that as a society, we evolve past this, um, either because we learn to ignore the trolls, you know, the phrase don't feed the trolls, uh, or people just give up. But yeah, I mean, most things have a positive and a negative. I'd like to Absolutely. think that technology has more positives than negatives. Absolutely. So last question for you. There's such a stigma associated with, with being lonely. How do we normalize loneliness? Uh, you know, that, that's a really tough one. I, I don't, I, again, I, I think that people don't have the correct definition of lonely. Uh, uh, there's a big difference between being alone and being lonely. And I don't know that I want to normalize loneliness because, you know, feeling lonely is most people who are lonely don't feel good. It's like saying I want to normalize the flu. Uh, I. I would like to find people with the flu and cure them so they can get on with their lives. Uh, if somebody's lonely, I wish that we would find ways to engage them and understand that it's not that they're antisocial, it's not that they're bad in any way, it's just that they're lonely and that's a real thing. And I think if people understood that, they might be much more inclined to try to connect with that person, to invite them out. Basically, I wish that the entire world operated like we do at Christmas. For some reason, we have this idea that nobody can be alone during the holidays. Nobody can be alone during the holidays, but the rest of the year, you can be alone. Uh, and and that's, that's fascinating to me. We understand that being alone on Christmas is devastating, but yet we don't understand that being alone on March 15th is devastating to some people. So I, I, I think that's really what we have to understand. People who are lonely want to make friends, they just don't know how. I could honestly listen to you speak for hours, which is why we all need to tune into uh, Gabe's podcasts. Um, any last thoughts for the audience before we open it up to the uh, Q and A? Sincerely, I, I don't have any. I really think that I said I don't have any, and then I started to say something. That's a thing I do. Uh, I really wish that people would keep an open mind about these things. I, I, I honestly believe that so many people believe that they understand things. And they're not bad people. They believe that they understand it, and they're unwilling to listen to alternative points of views, perspectives, et cetera. And, and it allows this, you know, this sort of ignorance to continue. Uh, I would really like to see a, a place where we adopt this idea that, hey, maybe I don't know everything. Uh, that's really hard because I do know everything. But, but sincerely, I, I think that there's a lot that we can learn about these, these, these concepts and, uh, but you've got to keep an open mind to do it because some of it is counterintuitive. So be open, ask good questions, and try to share more and listen more. Thank you so much, Gabe. I, I can't wait to meet you. And uh, now we'll open it up uh, to the audience and answer some of the questions that have come in through the chat function. If you have questions, keep them coming. For those that we don't get to, we will send out the responses with the archive. Um, so first question for our, all of our panelists. Um, let me just, I'm also going to, okay. Uh, so we've listed everyone's contact information here in case you'd like to connect with them directly. And again, if you have questions, type them into the uh, question box on your uh, panel. So I'm going to ask the same question to all of our panelists um, that I asked Gabe. Again, there's such a stigma associated with being lonely. How do we start to normalize loneliness? Anyone want to take that question on? Bree or Dr. Holt Lundstad, Dr. Noble? I'll I'd be happy on. to start. So I think part of it is, and I really love Gabe's response, part of it is what does normalize mean? It doesn't mean to say, oh, it's okay, uh, and we should just ignore it and go on to something else uh, that's more pressing and urgent. But, I, you know, to me, I, I think it's the same uh, advance we've made in mental health broadly, where 
uh, although by no means uh, perfect, there is a, a greater willingness to talk about anxiety disorders, bipolar, depression. It's still a stigmatized area, but in just the last 10 years, it's really emerged uh, from the shadows, if you will. I think loneliness is still very much in the shadows. It is so associated on an individual level with a sense of being incomplete, defective, uh, there's something wrong with me, and there's guilt and shame associated with that perception. So for me, normalization means moving past these negative emotions we have associated with the topic, a recognition that loneliness might be a part of the individual and social fabric, and that it's a burden shared by many and that it's also a burden that we can move past by fostering mechanisms and opportunities for more authentic connection. Thank you, Dr. I'll, Noble. I'll also add to that. Um, in, in my conceptualization of this, I think it also may be helpful to look at the counterpart of social connection. And uh, if we think about this, um, you know, given the evidence shows uh, the profound effects it has on health, if we think about this similar to how we think about other kinds of uh, lifestyle factors, um, and we think about, you know, being physically active and, and, and you know, so diet and nutrition, uh, we can think about how while all of us know we need to do better at exercising or eating our fruits and vegetables, all of us can benefit from being more socially connected. Um, and so there, there does seem to be somewhat of this stigma around uh, loneliness. And uh, perhaps by focusing on, on the goal, um, connecting socially, uh, that may may help some of that. Uh, it also um, helps us recognize that this is something that every that applies to every one of us. That every one of us um, that social, connecting socially is is considered a biological need. Uh, and if we think about loneliness, sometimes we think of it very in a very dichotomous way in that. People are either lonely or they're not. Um, when in reality, it's it's really we're all on a continuum. And so, if we can talk about it in that way, that may help as well, rather than um, thinking of it as something that you know applies to this person or that person, but not to me. When in reality, we're all somewhere on that continuum. Thank you, Dr. Holtlandstead. Um, so, Bree, question for you. What is one of the most interesting or exciting ways you've tried to help um, feel less yeah. alone? Um, one of the newest things that I've seen a lot of uh, that I'm pretty excited to try is um, virtual reality. Um, I know somebody who has kind of set up this little group and they wear their virtual reality headsets and um, talk to each other as avatars. And I think that's kind of like, it's kind of neat. It reminds me of um, the early days of the internet and the chat rooms and stuff like that, but really upgraded. So that's one thing that I definitely, I can't wait to try that. Thank you. So we are a few minutes past two. I encourage you to keep the questions coming. Again, we will respond to all of the questions um, in our follow-up communication. Uh, so. Here we have a, um, I encourage you all to submit any of your uh, works related to participatory medicine uh, at this link here. And again, we will circulate the, this uh, after the webinar as well. Uh, we hope we've left you with an understanding of the power of meaningful human connections and the steps that we collectively need to take as a community to address social isolation and loneliness. Uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.